everybody. Good morning and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at the church and it is such an awesome privilege to have you with us today. Hey, if you've just arrived, why not leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well, or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, eagrm.org. Just drop us a line, and we'll connect with you right away. Now it's just about time for Online Church to get started. So if you haven't already, right now is the perfect time to get a Bible, get a coffee, and let's prepare our hearts for another great morning of worshiping God and hearing from His Word at EAG Church Online. Oh, my soul, forget not all his benefits. How his light has shone through darker days than this. He has been faithful. He's always faithful. Even as I'm walking through the wilderness, standing in the valley, I'll remember this. Has been faithful, he's always faithful. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord, and my confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. So I won't fear the fire or the wind and waves, for the name I call upon will be the same. Cause Jesus is faithful, He's always faithful. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. And my confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. So I lift my countenance beyond the circumstance. My feet are planted, I won't be shaken. My God. Will always make a way. So I live my countenance beyond the circumstance. My feet are planted, I won't be shaken. My God will always make a way. Cause I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. And my confidence remains in the name above all names. Cause I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. My confidence remains in the name above all names. I know where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. So I live 
my countenance beyond the circumstance my feet are planted I won't be shaken my God will always make a way my God everybody welcome back to our studio today as we continue our message series at the cross and so uh, instead of our live service that we record and then put online we're we're recording in our studio today to keep on track here so we want to continue the second part of our cries from the cross and so one of our key theme verses that we've been looking at is the apostle paul said i preach christ crucified he, he says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So, so just that verse there tells us that the whole human race is divided into those two categories, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Now, so far with our theme, as we've looked at the cross, we looked at the crowd around the cross, the criminals that are on either side of Christ on the cross. We looked at Jesus himself on the cross, and then last week we began the cries from the cross, or you might have known it as the seven last sayings of Jesus. So during his ministry, when people heard Jesus speak, they said, no man has ever spoken like this. He speaks with one of authority. We know that the words of Jesus could still a storm and could raise the dead and heal the lepers. We know that in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. And Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And so when we talk about these seven last sayings of Christ, they're these same powerful words, but they have kind of a different meaning for us. And so three times Jesus spoke toward humanity. Three times he spoke toward heaven. Once he spoke to all heaven and earth. He spoke three times before the darkness. He spoke three times after the darkness, and then he spoke once while he was in the darkness. So before we get started, let, let's have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to give a quick review from last week, and then we'll get started. Father, this is your holy word. We know that it's anointed. We know that it's blessed. But we pray that, it, pray that this word will be planted firmly in our hearts and grow to bear good fruit in Christ's name. Amen. So last week we looked at the first three words which were spoken uh, before the darkness. And what we did is we, we gave the verse where it came from and then we had the key word of that verse and, and what kind of word it is. And so the first of the famous last sayings in Luke 23, 34 says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And so the, the key word from that verse is forgiveness, which is the most beautiful word, because we all need God's forgiveness. The second cry from the cross comes from Luke 23, 43, in which Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. The, the key word from this verse is salvation, which is the most essential word, because we need to be saved. Then the third word from the cross was in John 19, where a paraphrased version, Jesus says, woman, here is your son, John, here is your mother. And the key word there is mother, the most affectionate word. Now, we get to the fourth word, and we find it in Matthew 27. This is the only time that Jesus asked a question, and he asked it in the darkness. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama saskabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the key word here is why. And I'm going to call this an illuminating word. Because here the darkness comes at an unexpected time at noon when the sun should be shining bright high in the sky. It's at a time when it's least inspected or uh, as Charles Spurgeon would say, it was midnight at midday. And we know this wasn't random because it came over all the land, the Bible says. It was more than an eclipse because this was at Passover when the moon was at its farthest distance from the sun. So this is a supernatural event. Now, there are three events of darkness in the Bible. The first one at the beginning of creation, where God said, let there be light, and there was light. The second takes place in Exodus 10, where the Egyptians were cast into the kind of darkness that the Bible says could be felt for three long days. And this was done to mock their belief in Ra. 
you know, the supposed sun god. Then the third time of extended darkness is right here, right before his first, fourth cry from the cross, right there in it, where he says, as the glory of the Lord filled the night sky at Jesus' birth in the bright light. So now we have this unexplainable darkness at his death. Now, I didn't write down all the instances, but just so you know, darkness is almost always connected with the judgment of God. It was midnight at midday because Jesus became legally guilty of our sin and was judged accordingly. And so the mystery about Calvary is, how is it possible that one man could die on the cross 2,000 years ago and take upon himself all the sins of the world? And that has a meaning for us. Well, here's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree curses everyone who is hung on a tree. Isaiah 53.6 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this word forsaken is very strong. It means to desert, to disown, to turn away from. And what I want you to get from this is this was more than just feeling Jesus feeling forsaken. He was literally abandoned by almighty God at this moment. In the darkness, Jesus speaks a word that every one of us has probably asked God at one point or we will in our lifetime. God, why? Why did they die now? Why did this happen to them? Why did they die so young? God, why, why, why? And there can be many instances in our life where we don't understand what's happening. We're we're, we're, Christians, we love God, we read the Bible, we pray, but things happen in this life. and And sometimes we say, God, why? Sometimes maybe we get answers, sometimes we don't. But I'm telling you that Jesus knew what it was to be forsaken by men. He came into his own and his own received him not, the Bible says. He was forsaken by his family. He was forsaken by his disciples. One denied him and one betrayed him. But never until now had Jesus been forsaken by his father. Notice his cry. He doesn't address the Almighty as Father. He addresses him as God. Because at this moment, he's forsaken by God. He wasn't the Father's son when it became dark. He was a sinner's sacrifice. Now, there's three things about this fourth cry from the cross I want you to see here. Why illuminates Christ's sacrifice on the cross? Jesus was the centerpiece of heaven. By his power, the Bible says, all things were created by him and for him. He was the glory of the universe and the praise of the angels. And he laid aside his position at the right hand of God. He also forsook his person. He could claim to be God. He could claim to be the sovereign rule of the universe. And yet the Bible says Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So the creator became the created. And he had to become human a being in order to experience all that we experience so that he could be the good high priest. He also sacrificed his power. Because the truth is that Jesus could have come down from the cross. He forsook his purity. Now, that doesn't mean that God made him to be a sinner because Jesus never sinned. God exhibited his holiness and satisfied his justice by pouring out his wrath on the one who was made sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 again says it like this, For God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. So, why illuminates Christ's sacrifice on the cross? Secondly, this question, why illuminates Christ's separation on the cross? He says, why hast thou forsaken me? See, do do you know what hell is like? Hell is more than fire. It's more than brimstone. It's more than being with the devil and all uh, the demons. Hell is in its basic form is eternal separation from God. On the cross, Jesus suffered everything that you and I would have suffered if we were eternally separated from God for that small amount of time he suffered. Hell is a place of hopelessness. There's no hope of getting out. There's no hope of peace. There's no hope of joy. All hope is gone in hell. Hell is a place of helplessness. In Luke 16, 24, the rich man dies and goes to hell, and he cries out for mercy. He cries out for just a drop of water. He cries out that Father Abraham could send witnesses back to his five brothers, but he's helpless. 
He can't change his destiny. He can't change anything about anyone else's destiny. That's what it is. Why illuminates Christ's sacrifice? It illuminates Christ's separation. And thirdly, it illuminates Christ's salvation for us on the cross. Sin not only put Jesus on the cross, but sin separated Jesus from the Father. When you see the suffering of Jesus on the cross, then you understand how much God hated sin. And it had to be punished. But not only was God condemning and punishing sin, but he was extending his love for us because the scripture said, for God commends his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God was willing to go to any length necessary to have a relationship with us. So why we see Christ's sacrifice, the separation, the salvation. So, so the key takeaway that I want you to hear is this. No other believer has ever been forsaken by God except Jesus. And he did it so that we wouldn't have to be. No dying saint, no Christian martyr has ever been forsaken. No believer on his deathbed has ever been forsaken by God. In fact, one of the greatest promises we have in the Bible is that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. No matter how dark the trial, no matter how loud you're crying, God, why is this happening? I want you to take away this from this part of the message. God is there to help you and to comfort you. Now, you might feel forsaken today. You might feel God doesn't care. You, you might feel that in your hour of great trial that you're going through, that, that, you know, it's dark, you know, it's dangerous. You're crying out to God, but you don't know that you think he hears you. But God did not forsake David when he sinned. God did not forsake Moses in the wilderness. God did not forsake Peter when he betrayed the Lord. God did not forsake the Apostle Paul when he was in a, a, a prison in Rome. He didn't forsake John when he was, you know, on the Isle of Patmos. And the psalmist said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. So you can take that to the bank, my friend. We find the fifth statement of Jesus in John 19 again. Verses 28 and 29. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. The key words here is, I thirst. And I'm just going to call that one of the most human words because all of us have, uh, maybe the time you're listening to this, you've already had something to drink because you were thirsty, you've thought about it, or as you know, little kids say it all the time, you know. There's a lot of things that only Jesus could say, but this fifth statement is something every person could say. And that, that just reaffirms the fact that Jesus, you know, was fully God, but he was also fully human. A small boy was sent to bed by his father. Five minutes later, he said, Dad, and Dad goes, what? He said, I'm thirsty. Couldn't you bring me a drink of water? Dad said, no, lights out. Five minutes later, Dad, what? I'm thirsty. Can I have a drink of water? I told you, no. If you ask again, I'll have to spank you. Well, of course, a couple minutes later, Dad, what? When you come to spank me, can you bring me a drink of water? You know, kids have done that. You know, they get thirsty and they just ask and, you know, we help them. But see, there's an interesting twist here to this because when they first put Jesus on the cross in Mark 15, it says they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So at the very beginning where he's already been beaten, he's already been scourged, he's already been mocked and, and carried the, the cross uh, to this place as far as he could until uh, you know, someone else took it and carried the rest of the way. The, he, certainly he's thirsty now, but he won't take it because myrrh was used as a necrotic and was really potent with mixed with wine. Now, now the Roman executioners offered Jesus this sedative to try to take the edge off the pain, but they didn't do it for Jesus' benefit. They did it for their own. Because, see, those Roman soldiers were on duty till those criminals died. And so, you know, if they didn't have to listen to their screams of agony all day till they died, then, then that would just, you know, kind of let them have a little bit more of an enjoyable time, if you could say it like that, while they're sitting there waiting for these criminals to die. On the cross, the Son of God who makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust said, I thirst. The one who said, I'm the water of life, yet here he is on the cross saying, I thirst. Jesus has said, let him who thirsts come after me, and I'll give him living water. And he comes to me and drinks, shall never thirst again. Yet Jesus says, I thirst. Why? Why did he say that? Well, he said, I thirst because of how he agonized. He suffered as a man. He surrendered as a man. 
And he's also crying out, I thirst, because he was subdued as a man. Jesus said, I thirst because of what he accomplished. Jesus, knowing that all things had now accomplished, he said, I thirst. It's as though the last thing Jesus thought of on the cross was about himself. He uses this personal pronoun about himself for the first time. He says, I thirst. Only after, after he's asked forgiveness for his enemies, after he's assured a criminal next to him that, that he, he, will, he is saved, after he cares for a mother, you know how different he is than most people. Most people think about themselves first and then everyone else. But Jesus had secured the provision of our salvation. He secured the prophecy of Scripture. Some 380 prophecies about the Messiah had been fulfilled in Jesus' life, his birth, his death, and all this. You know, and, and so Psalm 22, 15, he says, My mouth is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So Jesus has secured the provision for salvation. He secured the prophecy of Scripture. And thirdly, he secured the propitiation of sin. 1 John 4.10, the Bible says, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That just means that Jesus made a payment for sin that we could not pay because he was perfect. He was sinless. He fulfilled everything in the law. So, so he was a sinless substitute for you and I. So Jesus was thirsty because of how he agonized. He was thirsty because of what he accomplished. And thirdly, Jesus said, I thirst because of what he asserts about us. I don't know if you know, but John 19, 28 was Mother Teresa's favorite verse. Mother Teresa founded Sisters of Charity in Calcutta, India. You know, she has passed on. But every home she founded was for the poorest of the poor. And it would always have a picture of Jesus with the words of John 19, 28, I thirst. And she wanted the world to know that her mission was to quench others' thirst. And friends, that's now our mission. We're not just talking about water here or something. We're talking about spiritual thirst. We're, we're talking about soul thirst. We're talking about people that are hungry. In fact, Amos 8 gives us a great prophecy description about our time when it says the time is coming when I will send a famine on the land. People will be hungry, but not for bread. They'll be thirsty, but not for water. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border searching for the word of the Lord, but they'll not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint, thirsting for the Lord's word. People look on the outside but are empty, lonely, dissatisfied, thirsty, and we have a responsibility to help quench others' spiritual thirst. That's, that's our job now. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 42, And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person certainly will not lose their reward. So the takeaway here is Jesus was thirsting so you and I would not. Whatever pain you have, Jesus understands. Jesus was abused. Jesus was beaten up. He was rejected. Have you been misunderstood? Jesus was misunderstood. Whatever you have experienced, Jesus understands. Jeremiah wrote about this same generation that I'm talking about when he says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And that's what's happening in our world today. The next, the sixth word we read in John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And the key words here are finished. The greatest word ever spoken. It says he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. Three words in English, but it's one word in Greek, tetelestai, meaning finished or accomplished. This is the greatest word ever spoken because it was spoken by the greatest person who ever lived. Only Jesus could have spoken this word. In the basement of a church in Florence, Italy, are the incomplete masterpieces of Michelangelo. In fact, it's been said that he had more uh, unfinished works than he did finished works. Abraham, as great as he was, could not say that he fully finished God's work. David, as great as he was, could not say he finished God's work. He was a great warrior king, but because of that, he was not able to build the temple that he longed to build. Paul, as great as he was, could not say he fully finished God's work. Only Jesus, the Son of God, who came to seek and to save the lost, who spent six hours dying in that cross of suffering, could cry out, it's finished. He fulfilled every requirement the Father gave him. He obeyed every demand the Father made. He fulfilled everything the law demanded of him. He was tempted in every aspect that you and I would be tempted, and yet he did not sin. 
Romans 8, 3 says it like this, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. When Jesus said it is finished, he was not saying I'm finished because three later, days later we know he was resurrected from the grave. Jesus speaks this word in the third person singular, which means Jesus was not speaking of himself, but of something else when he said, it is finished. This word was spoken in the indicative, which is certainty. There was no doubt about it. Tetelestai, it is finished. It's absolutely done. Not only that, but the passive voice indicates that he had been acted upon by some great intention, some great force. He did not say, I finished it. He said, it is finished. It's like all that had been happening in the Old Testament, all 39 books, he could write across Christ, the Messiah, in his blood finished. In fact, Jesus had told us he didn't come to do away with the Old Testament to fulfill it. So here it is. Paul writes in Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he had taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He fulfilled scripture. He satisfied the law. He paid my penalty and your penalty. He conquered sin and death and he defeated Satan. So what's the takeaway? He didn't say finish, but. He didn't say it is finished, but now you've got to be a good person. Now you better be in church every Sunday. Now you better read. He didn't say, you know, it's finished, but. See, it's not Jesus plus doing anything else. Good works and Christian service are the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. We work, the Bible says, because we are saved, not to be saved. So, so this is just, a, that's a, just reminding you of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now we come to the seventh and final saying of Jesus on the cross, and it's in Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. The key word here is into thy hands. This is the securest word ever spoken. The last words that Jesus spoke here, others have adopted as their own. Dying saints like Polycarp and Jerome and Martin Luther. When John Huss was being led to execution, he cried, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. I can tell you emphatically that a person who knows the Lord has a close walk with Christ dies differently than people who do not know the Lord. And I've experienced that personally with many people that I've been by their side as they passed. Now, we, we looked extensively at why Jesus died, but this really shows us how Jesus died. So let me tell you how he died. Number one, Jesus died prayerfully. There were three prayers that Jesus prayed on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he prayed, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, what's interesting is it took six days for God to create the world and on the seventh day rested. Seven is a number of perfection or completion. Seven notes on a musical scale. Seven days in a week, seven colors in the rainbow. Some say six, but, but just as creation was a finished work and on the seventh day God rested, after Jesus cried, it is finished, the seventh cry was like the word of rest, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He had finished the work of redemption. He had given himself as a sacrifice for sin and involuntarily says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit and he gave his spirit to God. His death was voluntarily. This is especially important because Jesus was just no martyr on the cross. Jesus was not a victim on the cross. The Bible says that Jesus willingly gave himself voluntarily. He said, no man takes my life. I give my life as a sacrifice for many. He died triumphantly. This is not the death of one who has been conquered. This is the death of one who is a conqueror. In fact, he's more than a conqueror and says we are as well. Jesus cries on the cross, it is finished. And he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I've done everything I came into the world to do. I've accomplished everything you sent me to accomplish. Now, victoriously, I, I commend my spirit to you. So not only did he die prayerfully, but he died peacefully. Jesus had peace even when he was on the cross. Because he has confidence in the Father. There is no safer place to be than in the hands of God. The hands of God are hands of creation. When you think about creation, somebody said that God made uh, three-fourths of the world water and one-fourth of the world land. So people should spend three times as much time on water fishing than on dry land. Must have been a fisherman that said that, right? God's hands are hands of compassion. 
God is loving. God is kind. God is caring. In fact, the great apostle Peter said, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares about you. He cares what happens in your life. He cares about what's happening to your family. He cares about what's happening to your kids, about what's happening in your home, your church, and on the job, in your marriage. There, there's no safer place to be than in the hands of God. Jesus committed himself to the hands of the Father because he had complete confidence. And you and I need to do the same, not just when we're getting ready to die, but for our whole life. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For I know in whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted him until that day. So, so here's a thought. How about entrust your life to God because he, the Bible says he can keep it. You know, I hope you're in the hands of God today. That's the safest place to be. Jesus died prayerfully. He died peacefully. And thirdly, he died powerfully. You say, well, it doesn't look very powerful. He's dying on a cross. Well, Matthew 27 says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Oh, what happens then? At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus and who crucified Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. Surely it was. The Bible says as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even those who believe his name. People that die a powerful death are those who have a powerful testimony that they were faithful to the Lord. And that, that's a words from an old sign. May all, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May our kids... Our Garen kids, as they come up, see that we, that we live powerfully and we die powerfully. We left them a great testimony. So the takeaway is that if you are in Christ right now, you are in the safest place to be in this life. When death comes, you're still going to be in a safe place. Okay? I want, I want to end with a story here, and it's kind of a little allegory if you can listen to, to what it's saying here. But it says, once upon a time, twin boys were conceived in the womb. The spark of life grew and each tiny brain began to take shape and form. With the de development of their brain came feelings. With feelings came perception. Twin boys in the womb of their mother, they discovered that life was good. And they laughed and rejoiced in their hearts. One said to the other, we are lucky to have been conceived and to have this wonderful world. Each of the twins continued to grow and soon their arms and fingers and legs and toes began to shape. shape. We're changing, one said. What can it mean? The other said it means that we're drawing near to birth. An unsettling chill crept over them. They were afraid of birth, for they knew that it meant leaving their wonderful, safe world in their mother's womb behind. One of the twins said, if it were up to me, I would live here forever. But we must be born, said the other. It has happened to everyone else. How can there be life after birth, cried the one. Do we not shed our life cord in the blood tissue when we are born? And have you ever talked to anyone who has ever been born? Has anyone ever re-entered the womb after birth to describe what birth is like? No. If the purpose of conception and growth inside the womb was to end in birth, then truly our life is senseless. And if this is so, and life is absurd, and there really can be no mother. But there is a mother, protested the other. Who, who else gave us this nourishment? Who else created this world for us? We get our nourishment from this cord, and our world has always been here, said the one. And if there is a mother, where is she? Have you ever seen her? As soon as it was time. They both knew their birth was at hand, not sure of what to expect. They both feared what they did not know. That's how it is with death, isn't it? We fear what we don't know. They cried as they were being born into the light. They coughed out fluid and gas to dry air. And when they were sure they had been born, they opened their eyes, seeing life after birth for the very first time. What they saw was the beautiful eyes of their mother. And they were cradled lovingly in her arms. That was an anonymous. I'm not sure who wrote it. But friends, when the world is all you know, it's very easy to fear death. But there's no reason for us to fear death because what Christ accomplished on the cross was he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And his resurrection will guarantee our resurrection. C.H. Spurgeon said, our spirit is the noblest part of our being. Our body is only the husk. Our spirit is a living kernel, so let us put it into God's keeping. 
Hebrews 12, 2 said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then John 14, 2, 3 gives us this great encouragement. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. Father, I thank you that everything you accomplished on the cross was to guarantee our salvation, guarantee our eternal life in heaven with you and all the others who have gone before us and will go after us, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, I pray that anyone right now that, is, that doesn't understand the full ramification of the tra cross will come to the understanding that all of those words from the cross have deep meaning and, and deep rel revel you know, rel relativists for us right now, God, that we need to know what this means. We need to accept it and believe it. And we can thank you and rejoice in all these great words that we have from the cross. Father, help hear everybody's prayer right now as I call out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Well, one more time, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. You can also go to our website, eagrm.org. We would love to hear from you and get you connected with our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next week, as we come back together for another wonderful morning of online church. We look forward to having you join us. And so, until we see each other again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Have an awesome Sunday.